Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this video we're going to teach you how to use cursors in Microsoft SQL Server. The first thing we'll cover in this session are the basics of working with cursors in SQL. We'll explain what cursors are, show you the basic syntax for declaring a cursor, talk to you about opening and closing cursors, and show you how you can simply move through a set of records with your cursor. Once we've handled the basics, we'll move on and show you how you can make cursors actually useful. We'll tell you, show you how you can read values into variables through a cursor. Um, move on and then show you how you can execute a stored procedure within a cursor, which is where things get very interesting. We'll explain a few of the more advanced cursor options, and then as a final flourish, we'll show you how you can use cursors to update records one by one to create a running total. Lots to do, so let's get started. Most of the operations that you perform in SQL Server are designed to work on an entire set of data at one time. So if you think about trying to return a simple table of information from a database, you'd write a basic select statement, which would be executed against an entire table effectively in one step. Now a cursor works completely differently. A cursor is designed to point at one single record at a time. And that cursor can then move through a record set one row at a time until it reaches the end. Now there are two main effects of this. One is it gives you a much finer level of control over the individual records in a data set. It lets you do certain things you can't do in a set-based operation. I think the most obvious example probably is executing a stored procedure against each individual record, something you can't do in a normal set-based operation. The other um, effect, and hopefully an obvious downside, is that cursors work slowly. They're almost always inevitably slower than the equivalent set-based operation. However, they do have their uses, and this video is going to try to teach you how they work and show you a couple of practical uses for them. Before you can use a cursor, you first of all have to declare it, and the start of that process is kind of similar to the way you declare normal data type variables in SQL. So you begin with the word declare, then when you're declaring a cursor, you don't use an at symbol to precede the name. You just simply give your cursor a sensible name, so I'm going to call mine film cursor, and it's going to be a cursor, and it's as simple as that to begin with. The next part is to say what set of records that cursor is going to be used with. So on the next line, I'm going to start the line with the word for, and then I simply need to write a basic select statement, which will uh, determine which set of records the cursor will step over. So I'm going to say film ID, uh, film name, and film release date. And I'm going to make sure that that's selected from my table of films. So there you go, there's the basic declaration of a cursor. After you've declared a cursor, before you can do something useful with it, you need to open it. And the statement you use to do that is remarkably straightforward. It's the word open, followed by the name of your cursor. It can be easier, could it? So this statement effectively loads a set of records that are determined by your, um, by your select statement. After that, we're going to do something useful. Um, I'm going to add a quick note to myself to remind myself to do something useful here. And then when we finish doing something useful, we'll want to close the cursor. And that's equally straightforward. Close film cursor. One final thing we should do is a good bit of sort of good housekeeping just to tidy up and remove any references to our cursor is to do what's called deallocating it. So we say deallocate film cursor and that simply removes any references that are, that are held on the cursor. Now we're ready to start doing something useful with the cursor and the most fundamental thing you have to do in order to make that work is move the cursor to a record. So we do that with a statement called fetch. So what I'm going to do here is move the cursor to my first record in, in, the, in the record set. So I'm going to do that by saying fetch next from film cursor. And because my cursor has just been opened, that means that the, the next record is effectively the first one in the entire record set. And at this point, it's not going to be particularly impressive yet, but at this point, I'm just going to execute this code just so you can see the results. And what I should see is the very first record from my select statement is essentially selected. Now, the key to making a cursor useful is being able to tell it to continue fetching the next record until it reaches the end of the record set. And we can do that by testing the value of a global variable referred to as the fetch status. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a basic while loop, while at at fetch status is equal to zero. The value zero, when the value zero is returned by the fetch status variable, it means that the cursor is successfully fetching the next record. So while this is still true, I want to simply fetch the next record 
from my film cursor. And at that point, I've got the basic structure of a cursor which will open a record set and move from the first record through to the last. So if I execute this, prepare to be amazed, um, mainly with how slowly the thing runs. And this film table contains 260 records, I think, and you could see how long it took for that to be completed. So proof positive that cursors are not the quickest tool in SQL Server's box. Now before we move on to slightly more practical uses for a cursor, I just wanted to mention a few other things you can do with the fetch statement. You don't always have to fetch the next record. Um, there are several other possibilities here. Before I can do this, however, I need to make a quick modification to the type of cursor that I'm using. I'm going to turn my cursor into what's referred to as a scroll cursor, which gives me more options in the fetch statement. We're going to cover many of the extra cursor options a little bit later in the video, so just bear, uh, just, just accept that this is this is necessary at this point to make sure I can I can use my other fetch options. So now that I have this uh, this different type of cursor, a scroll cursor, I can modify what my fetch statement does. So in the first instance, when I try to move my cursor to the first record in the, in the, in the record set, I could, rather than saying fetch next, I could actually say fetch first, um, which does make a huge amount of difference in this example. It's just nice to know that you can do that. I could also reverse that process. I could say rather than fetch first, I could say fetch last from film cursor, which moves it to the, the very last record. And what I could do then is, rather than saying fetch next from film cursor, I could say fetch prior, which would move it effectively backwards for, through the record set from the last one to the first. So the end result wouldn't be that much different if I execute the code. Um, it just processes the record set in the opposite order. It still takes just as long to run, however, as you can see down here, still going through 260 records. Now, as well as moving sequentially through a record set, you can also tell your cursor to move to any specifically numbered record at any one time, and also tell it to move a number of records forwards or backwards. So let's say, for instance, that rather than fetching the last record to begin with, I want to fetch the tenth record in the record set. So I can say that uh, by saying absolute 10 from film cursor. So in the first example, after the cursor has been opened, it will move to the tenth record in the record set. What I'd then like to do is move 10 records at a time. So rather than fetch prior or fetch next, what I can say is fetch relative, followed by a number, and this I'm going to give the number 10. So that will move 10 records at a time through the cursor until it reaches the end. So if I execute that code now, it should take much less time to run because it's only returning 26 records rather than the 260 previously. And I can do this in reverse order as well. If I use a negative number for my fetch absolute statement, that will begin 10 records from the end of the cursor. And if I say fetch relative minus 10, that will step 10 records backwards through the cursor. So again, executing the code should return another 26 records, um, just in reverse order again. The next step in making our cursor slightly more practically useful is to change it from spitting out its output one record at a time, into reading the values of the outputs into variables instead. So to do that, I've got a separate page open, and I've returned to the basic cursor that we had set up earlier on, one which simply steps through a set of films from the film table. What I'm going to do now is declare a variable which can hold each one of these values from the three columns that I'm uh, selecting. So I can do that by declaring basic normal data type variables. I'll have one called at ID, and that'll be an integer, and I'll have one called at name, and that will be a varjar max, because I don't know how long the film names will be. And I'll have another one called, um, I'm just going to call it date. I need to, these are terrible names for variables, I admit, um, but it will be enough to, uh, to demonstrate the principle. So my final variable at date, which will be date time. So to get values from the cursor read into the variables as we step through, we need to make a modification to the fetch statement. So after I said fetch next from film cursor, I'm going to add another line which says into, and then I simply list the names of my variables. So I have at ID, at name, and at date. Hopefully you'll appreciate that the, the order of the variables is in the same as the data types of the individual columns being returned, and also have three variables, one for each of the three columns. I'll need to do that again in my while loop. So if I copy the into line there and paste that one below the next, the next fetch next statement, when I execute the code now, 
and won't see much of a result at all. Just the uh, lovely message, command completed successfully. So what I need to do now is work out what I can do with the values that I have stored in my variables. So now that I've got my variables captured, what I'm going to do is use them to print out a list of characters in each film. So all the work I'm going to do here is going to be within the while loop. And because I'm performing multiple operations now within the while loop, I'm going to need to add a begin and an end block. So there's my begin, here's my end, and I'm just going to indent the code installed inside there. Uh, one, spa one space inside uh, the begin end block. So what I can do now is start using the values of my variables to show some information. I'm going to use the print statement quite a lot here. So I'm going to say, uh, first of all, print. I'm going to print the title of my film, which is at name, and I'm going to concatenate that with a little phrase released on, and concatenate that with a formatted version of my date. So I'm going to use the convert function, convert to char 10, um, the at date variable and then finally the uh, the code I'm going to use is 103 so that, that generates basic UK date formatting then below that I'm going to print out a simple little uh, let's see simple little underline and then I'm going to say print list of characters so that will just generate a simple little header for each section in order to print out the list of character names, I can simply use a basic select statement. So if I say select from, and the table I want to use this time is called TBL cast, and then there are a simple, uh, simple couple of columns I can use. I'm going to use cast character name. The other column that I need to use is actually in the where clause. So I only want to print out a list of character names where the cast film ID is equal to whatever, whatever value is held in my at ID variable. So there we go, there's a basic set of code that is going to be executed for every single record one by one in the record set. To make sure the results come out reasonably sensibly, I'm going to make sure I've set my results to text. I could just press Control T on the keyboard for this, or click the tool up at the top there. And then giving myself enough space to show the results, if I execute the code, this is the sort of stuff I'm going to get. So there we go. One by one, through the record set, we get a printed piece of information about the name of the film, when it was released, and a list of the characters in it. So this example works, although it's still admittedly not that impressive, um, but it's enough to give you an idea of the, the sorts of things you can do within a cursor. It's not just limited to selecting individual records one after the other. One thing that would make this a little bit more impressive, I think, would be encapsulating the logic of what we're doing here within a store procedure, which would make the overall code we're writing with our cursor much more elegant and much easier to read. So I've already made a start, actually, by writing out the code which will generate a store procedure, which will perform the logic that we've written out in our main procedure there. So it prints the same three lines of, uh, of information and selects the same set of records. And this is going to work based on accepting a list of three parameters. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. We've, we've produced videos on how to create store procedures earlier. So uh, if you're interested in how store procedures work, you're more than welcome to go away and watch those ones. What I'll do first I'll, is I'll execute this code to create my procedure. There we go. Lovely commands complete, completed successfully. And what I need to do now is call this store procedure sp list characters from within my main um, loop. So if I go back to this code, I'll remove all of my previous logic and simply replace that with a line which says execute my store procedure. And I need to pass in the three values. So I need to pass in the values stored in my variables at name, sorry, at ID, at name, and at date. And to save a bit of time, I'm just going to quickly copy those. So, with that done, if I execute this code once more, I'll just give myself a bit more space so we can see what's, uh, what's going on. Sorry about this little graphical glitch, by the way, at the bottom of the screen. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. If I execute this, I'll get exactly the same results as last time, but with a, a much, much neater and easier to read main procedure, I think. 
your stored procedures can do far more elaborate things than just list out a, a list of records as well by the way so the power in this is in working out what you can do inside the stored procedures you want to create so now we've seen a couple of examples of how basic cursors work, I want to spend a bit of time talking about the other options you can use when you're declaring a cursor. And I'm going to start with, uh, with looking at the scope of a cursor. Now you can set that to be either local or global, and you can specify that by simply adding one of those two words after the word cursor in your declaration. Is it that simple? Now the difference is, is as follows, the global cursor type can be referred to from anywhere within the connection in which it's created, so that includes any stored procedures which are called within this connection. Local on the other hand is restricted purely to the batch in which this cursor is declared. So at this point if I execute this code here it will work happily. If I do something as simple as add a go statement in between the declaration and opening my cursor, when I execute it, it will fail every single time it's been referenced, so where I try to open it, close it and deallocate it. Now if you don't specify which scope you want to use, the cursor will use whichever is the default for the database, and you can modify that from the Object Explorer if you find your database and right click and choose to view its properties. On the dialog box which appears there's an options page and in there is an option for what the default cursor scope is, either global or local. So you can see mine set to global, I'll leave that set as it is. Now the next option for a cursor determines what type of scrolling you can use with it. So this affects what fetch options are available for the cursor you've declared. Now there are two options here. There is scroll, as we saw earlier on when we were investigating fetch options. Scroll cursors allow you to use, rather than just fetch next, you can use things like fetch first, fetch last, fetch prior, etc. The other type of cursor, and the one that's the default actually, if you don't specify this property, is called forward only. And hopefully, obviously, that only allows you to use fetch next. If I have a forward only cursor declared, and I try to execute a fetch first statement on it, I'll see an error message fairly sensibly described actually. You can't use a first fetch with a forward only cursor. So for this one to work, you must make sure that you're using a scroll cursor instead. The next option you can use is something which sets what type of record set your cursor returns. And there are four options available here. These are static, dynamic, key set, and one called fast forward. Now, the technical descriptions of these are quite long-winded. I'm going to post a link to the Microsoft uh, website which explains in fine detail what all of these options actually mean. But fast-forward is particularly useful when you're using um, when you're stepping through a set of records to read their values. You, want, you don't want to make any changes. So it declares a forward-only cursor, which is read-only, so you can't make any changes to the data. But it also has performance optimizations enabled, which means it's more quick to use than just a bog-standard forward-only cursor. The other types of record set you can declare determine what sort of thing you can do with the data. So static creates essentially a copy of your select statement results um, in the tempdb database. Because of this, you won't see any changes made to the data by other users if you're using a static record set. And you also can't make any changes yourself with a static set because it's not linked to the original base data. It's a separate copy in the tempdb database. Key set creates a copy of the key values from your uh, selected data and it stores those in a tempdb table. Uh, so what it does, it keeps a record of, of which records or which rows are part of the record set. You'll be able to see changes that other users have made to non-key values. So for instance, film name and film release date, in this example, of other users change those. When you fetch records, your cursor would reflect those changes. Um, you can't see changes made to added records or deleted records. The final type was uh, dynamic, and this is uh, the most flexible type of cursor. You'll see changes to every value, key values and non-key values made by other users, and you can change any values yourself that you want to. As I said, there's a much more technical detailed description of all those cursor types in the, uh, the MSDM page that I'll post a link to at the bottom of this video. 
The last option I'd like to mention sets the lock type for the cursor, and there are three settings available for this, which determines what you can do to the data um, with the cursor you've declared. So, for instance, making changes to the data. So the three settings you're allowed to use, there's read only, hopefully that one's obvious, that prevents you from making any changes to your data whatsoever. Um, if you declare a fast forward cursor, you'll get a read only one by default. The other two options then, there are uh, scroll locks, so there's a scroll lock cursor. Now that means that as soon as your cursor moves to a record, that record is locked, which prevents other users from making changes to it. And that's a way to guarantee that changes you make to a record will always succeed. The other type of cursor, the final one uh, in terms of lock type, is called optimistic. Now, this type of cursor only locks a record at the instant you try to make a change. And if another user had made a change to the record in between your cursor scrolling to it and then attempting to make the change or make the update, your update would fail. Again, there's much more detailed technical descriptions of these lock types on the, uh, the MSDM page. I'll post a link to it at the bottom of this video. The last thing to mention about cursor options is that you can combine multiple settings in one cursor declaration. So for instance, I could declare a, the scope of my cursor as global and it's scroll type as forward only and the record set type to static and the lock type to read only all within one single cursor declaration and that code will work perfectly happily. You do have to be wary of illegal combinations of settings, however. So, for instance, I couldn't declare a cursor that was both scroll and fast forward at the same time. So, even those are, those are values for two different settings. Scroll is a scroll type, and fast forward is the record set type. Those two in combination are illegal. If I execute the code, it will tell me, and again, a lovely, sensibly worded message saying that scroll and fast forward are conflicting options. For the final part of this video, I'd like to look at how you can use a cursor to modify records in a table. So the first thing you need to know in order to make that work is how to declare a cursor with updates enabled. As it turns out, the box standard basic declaration for a cursor is automatically set to allow updates. If you wanted to be a bit more explicit about that, you could add the phrase for update to the end of your declaration, and that will allow you to modify any field from the underlying record set. To be even more specific yet again, you can specify which field you'd like to be, enabled, to be enabled for updates. So I can say for updates of, and then have a comma separated list of which fields I'd like to be able to modify. I'm going to make sure that I can modify the film cumulative Oscars. I wish I'd, I'd picked a shorter field name here. But what we're going to do is we're going to, to run a, uh, a set of code which will generate a running total of Oscar wins for all the films in my table. So in order to make my running total system work, I need to declare a couple of extra variables at the top of my procedure, which can hold both the number of Oscars for each film. So I'll declare one called at film Oscars, and that's going to be an int. And I also need another one which can hold the running total of all the Oscars. So I'll have one called total Oscars, at total Oscars, and that's also going to be an int. I want to initialize my total Oscars variable so that it's got zero in it by default rather than null. Um, and then the very first time that I fetch a record into my cursor, I want to store the value of the film Oscars for that film in that variable. So I can say fetch next from film cursor into at film Oscars. Once I've successfully moved to the first record using the cursor, I want to set up the basic structure of my loop, which will move all the way to the end of the record set. So let's add in a while statement, while at at fetch status equals zero. So while I'm successfully fetching records, I want to begin and an end block. And what I'm going to do to make sure I move to the next record each time, I'm going to make a simple copy of this fetch statement. So there we go, that will now process my entire set of records. All I've got to work out now is what to do to update the information in the table. So the first step in actually updating the information in the table is to calculate the value of the total Oscar win so far. So I can do that with a symbol statement which says set at total Oscars plus equals at film Oscars. So that will simply add the value of the current film's Oscar wins onto whatever total is currently held in total Oscars. For the first film, that will add the value of the Oscar wins 
to a value of 0. As a quick little test at this point, I'd like to print the value of at total Oscars. So I want to see if my, uh, my Oscars are increasing as I go through the record set. So if I execute this code at this point, there we go. So that's that part's actually working. The next step is to get that list of values from a symbol printed message actually to be inserted into a table. So to place the value of the total Oscars variable in the table itself, I'm going to replace my print statement with an update statement. I'm going to say update TBL film. The next thing I need to do is say which field to change and what value to change it to. And I do that with a set statement. So I say set film cumulative Oscars equals at total Oscars. The final part of this update statement is vitally important to get right. As it stands, if I left my code as is, every record that I, my cursor moves to, it would update all of the film's cumulative Oscars to the current value stored in that variable. So it would simply get overwritten every single time. What I want to do is just modify each individual record. So I'm going to add a WHERE clause. There's a very specific WHERE clause this time. It's going to say WHERE CURRENT OF FILM CURSOR. So what that makes sure is that the only record that is modified is the same record that my cursor is currently pointing to. So fingers crossed, if I execute this entire set of code now, I should hopefully see many single rows affected, so that tells me that individual rows have been changed. So if I do a very, very quick test, what I should be able to see, if I had a basic select statement, let's say select star from TBL film, if I execute that basic select statement, I ought to end up with a value in my film cumulative Oscars column, and there it is. So there you go, there's one use for cursors. It's not impossible to do this using set-based operations, but it's certainly, I think, a lot easier to, uh, to make sense of when you're using a cursor. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wiseowl.co.uk.